He was part of one of the best college football defenses in recent memory as Georgia won the 2021 National Championship. Now Trayvon Walker is projected to be a high first-round pick in the 2022 NFL Draft. Is he a good fit for the Jets? We'll talk about that on today's episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Friday, April 8th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thank you for making this show your first listen or your first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit that subscribe button. You'll never miss an episode, and you'll get notifications as new episodes are posted. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube, I say it every day, but please give this episode a big thumbs up. If you enjoy the show and you want other Jets fans to be able to find it, that helps a lot. You'd be surprised how much that helps. So please, if you like this episode, give it a thumbs up. Well, each Friday through the offseason, with a few exceptions during free agency, we've tried to profile an NFL draft prospect who could interest the Jets. And today we're going to continue that, and we are going to stay on the defensive side of the ball. Last Friday, I talked about Kayvon Thibodeau of Oregon. Today we're going to talk about Trayvon Walker, defensive end out of Georgia, a guy who was part of just an absolute, absolutely dominating defensive unit, a unit that carried Georgia to a national championship this year. We're going to talk about some of the things he brings to the table, some of the question marks around his game, and whether or not he's a good fit for the Jets at either 4 or 10. And you see Walker more and more, the deeper we've gotten into the offseason, the closer we've gotten to the draft, he's showing up on more and more mocks to the Jets. So let's begin by talking about some of the things Trayvon Walker brings to the table. And I think you have to begin talking about his physical tools because this is a guy who probably brings as much to the table athletically and in terms of measurements as any prospect could at the defensive end position. I mean, this is a guy 6'5", 272 pounds, so, you know, prototypical size. But then let's talk about his wingspan, 84 and a quarter inches. His arm length, 35 and a half inches. Hand size, 10 and three quarters inches. Those three, those three measurements, wingspan, arm length, and hand size, all three of them are better than 95% of defensive ends who have gone through the draft process in recent years. And these things matter. You know, you want big hands. You want to be able to kind of fight, fight with your hands. You want strong hands. Those, those are important. Arm length also matters. You know, we talk about arm length a lot at the tackle position because you want a tackle who was able to kind of set his base, kind of push, push, uh, you know, control defensive linemen who are rushing the passer you don't want to have to like get up on somebody you don't have to lean into them to be able to make contact with them you want to be able to have those long arms and be able to be able to control them with with your arms so that way they can't get leverage on you same thing goes on the defensive end in the defensive end position so arm length matters there too but then you look at his athletic testing and i mean this is again this is kind of off the charts good he ran the 40 yard dash in 4.51 seconds and I'm using this website, mockdraftable.com, that has a historic database. So that's where I'm coming up with these percentages. If you ever want to check out the way a player tested athletically at either his pro day or his combine, I definitely recommend it. I think it's a great resource to, to utilize. You know, sometimes I, I, I give you these statistics and I get an email afterwards. People are asking me where I came up with these numbers. So I'm going to try going forward to give you the websites I utilize as much as possible. And they do not, they don't have any ties to, they're not like a sponsor of the show. So I'm telling you this, like, this is a really good, re, this is just a really good resource. Uh, mockdraftable.com. So he ran out this 40 yard dash in 4.51 seconds. That's better than 98% of defensive end prospects. His 10 yard split, 1.62 seconds. That's better than 70% of defensive end prospects. Vertical jump, 36 inches. Better than 80% of defensive end prospects. Broad jump, 123 inches, better than 87% of defensive end prospects. The three-cone drill, 6.89 seconds, better than 93% of defensive end prospects. The 20-yard shuttle, 4.32 seconds, better than 76% of defensive end prospects. So a guy who's consistently throwing up numbers, when you're talking measurements and athletic drills, better than 90% of comparable players at his position. And even the ones he's not throwing up 90s on, he's in the 80s for most of these. So... 
a guy with incredible physical tools. And again, it's, it's across the board. You know, you look at the 40 yard dash, that really kind of measures just your raw speed. You look at things like the high jump and the broad jump, those are more explosion drills. The shuttle drills are more change of direction. So this is a guy who's like a great athlete across the board. He's not, I mean, he's not, we're talking about size. He's not enormous at 272 pounds, but he's prototypical size for a defensive end, the type of defensive end the Jets are looking for. So you're just talking about raw physical tools. He's got those. I think you also have to explore his role in Georgia's defense. Now, he's done. he did a lot of things. He lined up in a lot of different places in Georgia. He lined up standing up. He, landed, he lined up with his hand in the ground. On third downs in particular, they'd kind of move him around. You'd see him at points. He'd line up at the three technique. You'd see him line up over center, and the three technique is on the outside shoulder of one of the guards. You'd see him at times line up over center. You'd see him take a wide, you know, a wide alignment. You'd see him drop into coverage as well. I mean, they, they used him in many different areas, and he looked pretty fluid from what I could tell the times I saw him drop into coverage. Now, let's be honest. You're not going to draft a guy in the top 10 at the defensive end position to drop him into coverage. That's kind of like one of those things that's nice to have because you know, occasionally you may want to drop a guy into coverage to kind of fool the other team's alignment and protect yourself, zone blitz type of deal. I'm not saying I'm not saying this is a reason to drop the guy drop the guy in the top ten. That's kind of like you know talking about a wide receiver's run blocking or a corner's run support. It's not the thing that makes the, the decision for you, but it's a it's a nice to have. It's a nice little extra thing to have if everything else is already there. You'd rather have it than not have it. So that you know he he has experience lining up in a lot of different spots. That said, I think you know in, on early downs in particular. He had a very specific role in this Georgia defense, and that was really to kind of play the defensive end. And I kind of viewed it as like a power end type role where his job was to kind of set the set a hard edge, play the run effectively. And again, he used those strong hands. I think he did a very good job maintaining leverage. I think, you know, you have to try and figure out what a defense is trying to do because you can look at a prospect, and you see this every year where somebody's, some people are talking about what a prospect brings to the table and they look at what they do. But I, don't, I think sometimes people don't appreciate what a player's role is in the defense. And sometimes the defense is not built to make a player stand out. And a couple of years ago, and I, quite frankly, this is a guy I missed on Rashawn Gary out of Michigan. And I was very vocal that I did not want the jets to draft him at three. And he's turned into a tremendous player with green Bay. And I look back on this and you know, I, you kind of see that the reason he wasn't that productive at Michigan was they were having him play a very specific role. And it wasn't a role that necessarily accentuated all the things he did well it wasn't a role that made him stand out and there's that's a diff that's the difference between like a player on a team that's less talented a, pl a player on a team that doesn't have talent and who's an exceptional player their scheme is probably going to be built to make them stand out it's probably going to be built to put them in a position to make plays on a team like georgia where you have nfl talent up and down the defense you're just going to have guys play very specific roles you're not going to have you're not going to like build your defense to feature one player. You're just going to ask everybody to do their job. And I think for the most part, what Trayvon Walker's job was with Georgia above everything else was just to kind of play the run first and then try and get after the quarterback. So we're going to talk in a little bit in a little bit about some of the question marks Trayvon Walker brings to the table, but I think it's important to understand what a player's role is in this defense. And, you know, I go back to, I've talked about some of their their defensive ends, Jordan Davis in particular, how Jordan Davis really wasn't much of a pass rusher. Maybe Jordan Davis doesn't have pass rushing skills, but again, you have to consider the role somebody's asked to play in the defense. Sometimes a guy's not asked to play a pass rushing, a big time pass rushing role. Sometimes their job is to kind of play the run. And I think Trayvon Walker, it, 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 this also goes back to like Kirby Smart's defense. Kirby Smart, of course, coached under Nick Saban and Nick Saban and Bill Belichick collaborated for a couple of years with this, the Cleveland Browns. So it's kind of like a Belichick. It's a defense that has some Belichick tendencies to that. And if you know, if you follow Belichick, one of the things Belichick focuses on is stopping the run first. I mean, if you, I, it's, one of the things, some of the stuff I've read about him is like, he's very focused on, on having his guys make sure they're playing the run first. And I've always kind of felt like maybe that's why Chandler Jones, a guy like Chandler Jones, who was, a productive player in New England, but really broke out after he went to Arizona. Maybe him moving to a different scheme had something to do with his breakout. Whereas, you know, he, he was putting up double-digit sack seasons in New England, but he wasn't putting up 17, 19 sack seasons like he did in Arizona. Maybe in a scheme that allowed him to get upfield a little bit more. So when we're, we're going to talk about Trayvon Walker's numbers in a little bit, little bit, which are fairly unremarkable. 
But I think it is important to keep in context that I think he was, and from what I could gather, I'm kind of reverse engineering these things based on what I know about Kirby Smart and just based on what I know about the defense Georgia runs. But I feel like he was kind of in a role that was not asked him, that did not ask him to star, but he performed that role well. Again, he was strong against the run. He maintained leverage. He was not bad at shedding blocks. He had good hand strength. And another thing is, and I don't think at this point pass rushing is necessarily his strongest area, but I will say this. I feel like when Trayvon Walker's the aggressor, when he's attacking and he uses those strong hands, you know, he can get to the quarterback. Of course, though, with any prospect, there are questions. I think Trayvon Walker has a lot more question marks to him than a lot of other prospects in the top 10 will. And we'll discuss some of those questions as we continue here on this Friday episode of Locked On Jets. Of course, we're in the NFL offseason, but baseball is getting underway. A lot of teams opening up their schedule today. And you should know that Bet Online is your number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Find all of the latest sports developments, including this week's Masters Championships and, again, the opening of baseball season. You can get odds, podcasts, and reviews for all the different leagues this season. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. And even though it is the NFL offseason, there's plenty you can bet on. You can bet on draft status. You can bet on how teams are going to do in the NFL this season. I've talked about it in recent days. The odds are not great for the Jets, which could be a buying opportunity. If you really believe in what Joe Douglas did this past offseason, if you think the Jets are going places, they're pretty good odds if, if you think the Jets are going all the way this year. So check it out at Bet Online. Bet online, where the game starts. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listen every day. And make sure you're following Locked On NFL. Locked On experts covering the biggest stories around the NFL every Monday through Friday in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast, just like Locked On Jets. And if you like this podcast, hit that subscribe button. You'll never miss an episode. Today we are talking about Georgia defensive end Trayvon Walker, a guy you see projected potentially to go to the Jets at either 4 or 10 in various mock drafts. We're talking about, we talked about in the first segment, things that he brings to the table. But there are a lot of question marks with this player. And I don't think there's any question about it. This is not a guy with the type of production you'd like to see in a top 10 pick. And I gave you some of the context in the first segment, but you'd like to see more production out of a top 10 pick. I mean, that's just, I don't think there's any other way to put it. This is a guy who really was kind of a rotational player in Georgia up until this past season. And when you look at the talent that's on the Georgia defense, that's not necessarily a huge mark against him. Lots of very talented players there. And he did take on a a more prominent role this past year in what was an outstanding college defense. But at the end of the day, this is a guy who we're talking about potentially going in the top 10, who's coming into the NFL to be a pass rusher and has less than 10 sacks in his college career. And again, context matters. And I think sometimes we forget there's a difference between what a player's asked to do in college and what he's capable of doing. It's always possible that a player's capable of doing more. You know, he may have just been filling the role Georgia asked him to play, and he may be capable of doing more. But that's a projection. And whenever you're making a projection, there's a bit of a risk there. And I have to say, Trayvon Walker, I, I mentioned in the first segment, you know, when he's the aggressor, when he's, go, when he's attacking... He can get to the quarterback. He can beat an offensive lineman. But I have to say, that was not what happened most of the time. And I've talked in the past about pass rushing with a plan, where you, you, this is how I'm going to set up this offensive lineman. You know, I'm going to set him up by going faking outside, then going inside. I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to use this move. I don't see a lot out of Tra- I don't see a lot from that out of Trayvon Walker. And beyond that, I don't see a lot of counter moves. And the counter moves kind of you know when when your plan A doesn't work. And the offensive lineman kind of grabs onto you, and he be, he's a tough guy to shed. You know, you got to figure out a way to fight with your hands. You got to figure out what move you're going to use. It certainly seems to me from how when I've watched him, when an offensive lineman latches onto Trayvon Walker, Trayvon Walker doesn't have a lot of answers for that. So when you're talking about this player, I'm not sure you're necessarily saying this guy is doomed. I'm not sure you're necessarily saying that this guy is incapable of developing into a good player, but I am saying I I think you're making a bit of a projection here. And yes, he brings a lot of physical tools to the table. And if you're somebody who favors physical tools over production, 
this is probably going to be the player for you. I'm a fan of production. That's my bias. It doesn't always work out. Rashawn Gary's a good example. That was one I got wrong. There are players who are better pros than they are college players. And again, there's context that matters here. Part of the reason he wasn't productive was he was just on such a great defense. He was on a team with so much talent that opportunities did not readily present themselves. That's fair. Again, I think you have to go to look at his role on this defense, on what was a great defense. This was not a defense built to make his talents stand out. If he was on a different team, I think the defense is going to work very differently, and maybe you get a more productive player. That said, I mean, these are all just theories. These are possible reasons for why he wasn't more productive. There's another plausible theory out there that, you know, maybe he's just not as talented as he's being made out to be. Maybe these, and listen, physical tools absolutely matter in the NFL. There's a league full of supreme athletes. It's it's a league just full of, like, the greatest athletes you could find on the planet. Athleticism matters. But at the end of the day, the game of football is not the same as a track meet. There are plenty of guys through the history of this league who have posted dominant combine scores, who have had tremendous measurements, who haven't been good players because it just did not translate. So you look at Trayvon Walker, and you know he's got experience doing these things, and I do think he looks pretty solid against the run, but I'm not saying run's irrelevant, but I'm not saying it's as irrelevant as even dropping into coverage. You know, I, I a little bit earlier I talked about how you don't draft a defensive end to drop into coverage. You do draft a defensive end to play the run. It matters, but that alone's not going to get you into the top ten. If you're drafting somebody in the top ten, it's because you think they're going to be a great pass rusher. They're going to be the type of pass rusher that transforms your defense. And I think right now what the Jets are looking for, the Jets are kind of looking for instant production. I would have to imagine. So you got Carl Lawson on one side. On the other side, it's kind of a mystery. I'm sure you'll have John Franklin Myers there on early downs. Maybe you slide him inside on passing downs. But I think you're looking for a guy who's going to be able to contribute immediately. This is not the type of situation at the defensive end position where you are going to just draft a guy and let him sit for a year. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you just draft a guy, you let him get on the practice field for a year, and you say, well, all right, well, you're two. You'll take on a more prominent role. That's not really the situation the Jets are in right now. So I think that there might be some questions about Trayvon Walker as to whether or not he's the right fit. But that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to close out this Friday episode of Locked on Jets. And I'll give you my thoughts on how good of a fit Trayvon Walker would be for this team at either 4 or 10. And that's ahead here on this Friday, Locked on Jets. Of course, we all hope the Jets make great picks in the upcoming NFL draft. If they do, then... It'll be as good as eating a delicious Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market. These may be protein bars, but they don't taste like them because they're all covered in 100% chocolate. At Built Bar, they figure out how to make it delicious first. Then they figure out how to make it healthy. And somehow they pull it off every time because you've got delicious flavors, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond. And the bars are healthy. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Go to Built.com, check out all the flavors, find the Built Bar for you. And once you do that, use promo code LOCK15 at checkout. If you do that, I can get you 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCK15, L-O-C-K-E-D, number one, number five. It's one word for 15% off at Built, B-U-I-L-T dot com. Locked on Jets podcast here on this Friday. It's a Prospect Friday show. We're talking about Trayvon Walker out of Georgia. Talked about some of the things he brings to the table, some of the question marks that surround him. Now let's talk about whether or not he's a good fit for the New York Jets. And in all honesty, like I don't have a great answer as to whether or not he's a good fit because I think that you're kind of drafting him as a projection. And if you're drafting Trayvon Walker, you're kind of banking on two things. First of all, that all of your scouting work has suggested this is a player who can learn very quickly, a very coachable player. You're also banking on your coaching staff being able to develop him, teach him the things he needs. He's got the physical tools. Can he develop the football skills necessary to succeed as a defensive end in this league? Because he's, he's going to be put into a different role in this Jets defense than he would in Georgia, at Georgia, than he was at Georgia. I have to be honest with you, this would not be my pick at four. This would not be my pick at 10. If the Jets do it, I understand it. And I think that it will go into the idea that they really think that this guy's going to be a very coachable player based on their research, that he's going to be a very quick learner. 
and the coaching staff can figure things out with him. But I just don't know that this is the kind of guy that's going to contribute day one. And I think if you're drafting a defensive end, you're hoping to get some degree of contribution day one. And I understand, listen, I'm the guy that always says you got to keep expectations low for a rookie. That means, like, I don't expect the guy to be a star day one. But with Trayvon Walker, there's a very real chance if you draft him, you're not going to get anything in year one out of him. And I, I think it's an awfully risky pick, especially for where you're sitting. At four, it feels like there are there are players out there who could have just as much impact, but who give you a better chance of immediate contribution. And a guy who, you know, somebody who, let's be honest, the, the, the floor here is very low. A guy with less than 10 sacks in his whole college career. And again, that's my bias towards production. I, I'm... I prefer production over, I, I listen, I think both are important. I think production and physical tools are both important, but I'm always a little scared of the guys who are the incredible physical, you know, have the incredible physical tools, the great measurements, the great combine results, but don't have the track record of success because really you're kind of banking on a theory. You're banking on that theory that, all right, well, he wasn't put in this role, but he's capable of doing something different in the NFL than he did in, than he did in college. And yes, listen, sometimes it absolutely works out. I'm not saying it's impossible for it to work out. I'm not going to hate the pick if the Jets make it. I can see the upside. I've told you the ups. I've told you all the things he brings to the table. I told you all the possible pathways to success for Trayvon Walker. And in theory, a guy with his physical tools, if he can rush the passer in this defense, would be almost, I mean, it would be a perfect fit. Guy, guy who I think fits Robert Sala's scheme extremely well. And a guy who could be a great bookend to Carl Lawson. And if this guy develops, suddenly you've got a you've got, you've got a very good defensive line. You've got a defensive line that's going to be able to get after the quarterback. But you're banking on a lot of development here. And I like guys, especially high in the draft, I like guys whose games are already more refined. I like guys who are ready to play, who don't need to learn everything there is to learn about being a pass rusher. And that's kind of what Tra- where Trayvon Walker is right now. The guy who just doesn't have production. You're you're betting on pro, uh, projection versus produ- production. I like to bet on production. Doesn't mean projection guys always fail, but this is just not. I mean, I can live with it if they do it. I'll understand it if they do it. This is not my first choice, though. I have to be honest with you. And you know, it's entirely possible that you're watching this a few years from now and you're laughing at what uh, what a terrible scouting report I've given you here. And hi, if you're watching, you know, in 2025 and Trayvon Walker's turned into a great player. I, I'm not saying he's going to be a bust. I'm just saying this is not the direction I'd go in if I were the Jets and you're looking for somebody who can immediately step in and at least give you something. I'm not saying you need a pro bowler year one, but I think for this Jets team, they're not looking for a guy who's going to take a year or two to, to develop. And maybe he can learn it immediately, but it's, it might be a lot to ask. So those are my thoughts. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. But that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. If you enjoy the show, subscribe to it. You'll never miss an episode if you do that. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. It helps us out tremendously, as does giving this episode a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll be back next week to talk more Jets.